Hi there, and welcome to Military Histories, a podcast from York Army Museum. Each week we share an interview from the Royal Dragoon Guards audio archive. This season we will be sharing interviews with veterans of the Korean War. You can find more details about the Royal Dragoon Guards oral history project in the show notes. If you want to find out a bit more about our museum, there are links to our website and social media channels in the show notes too. In this week's interview you can hear Colonel Guy Wathen discussing his army experiences. The first eight minutes of this interview covers Guy's time in Korea. Thanks for listening, future episodes will drop every Friday. The date is Friday the 26th of July 2013 and I'm at the home of former Colonel Guy Wathen at Brancaster Stafe in Norfolk. Guy had a long career with the 5th Inderskill Intergroom Guards and I'm going to ask him now if he would like to relate how he actually started in the Army before he joined that regiment. Right, well, I was called up into the Army in September 1943 and I first joined the Coldstream Guards I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in May 1944 and joined the 5th Battalion in uh, Holland in uh, 1945. Um, When the battalion was disbanded at the end of the war, I then transferred to the Inneskilling Dragoon Guards and I joined the regiment in Itzehoe in Schleswig-Holstein in March 1946 moving to Munster later that year. During 1948, I was appointed ADC to Lieutenant General Sir Charles Keatley, who was GOCNC BAOR. This involved visiting not only all the British units in BAOR, as well as the Danish and Norwegian brigades under command, but also the United States and French zones. But the most significant operation of that year was the Berlin Airlift, when the Russians closed the road and rail links from the British, US and French zones into the city, hoping to force the Allies to withdraw their troops. But they reckoned without the determination of the three Allies, and planes loaded with food, fuel and other necessities took off from their zones and landed in Berlin every two minutes. The General had a twin-engine aircraft, which he used for visiting the British units in Berlin, and a flight had been authorised when the airlift started but the approach speed of his plane was so slow that 11 loaded skymasters had to fly back to Frankfurt without landing. Henceforth, we travelled on a cargo carrier. In 1949, I returned to the regiment, by now at Paderborn in Germany, as adjutant. In November 1950, the regiment sailed from Liverpool on the troop ship Georgic to relieve the 8th Hussars in Korea. We called at uh, Portside, Aden, Colombo and Singapore, where we were welcomed by our Colonel, General Sir Charles Keatley, who was now Commander-in-Chief Far East Land Forces. We went on to Hong Kong, Kyoto in Japan, and we disembarked in Korea at Pusan on the 2nd of December for the long train journey in cattle trucks to the Commonwealth Division area north of Seoul. Mr. Waffen, can you just tell me, please, uh, what equipment the regiment took with them to Korea? We only took with us our personal equipment. We took over the tanks and vehicles of the 8th Tsars. Which were? Chieftain tanks. Mr. Waffen, can you tell me, please, what equipment the regiment were using when you moved uh, when we were at Paderborn, we had, uh, well, before going to Paderborn, up in uh, Itzehoe, we had Comet tanks, and these were replaced by the new Centurions in Paderborn. After our time in Paderborn, we were moved to Korea in November 1950 to relieved the 8th Hussars. We sailed from Liverpool in the troop ship Georgic 
calling at Portside, Aden, Colombo and Singapore where we were welcomed by our Colonel, General Sir Charles Keatley, who was now Commander-in-Chief Far East Land Forces. We went on to Hong Kong and Kerry in Japan and disembarked in Korea at Busan on the 2nd of December for the long train journey in cattle trucks to the Commonwealth Division area north of Seoul. For an armoured regiment trained to oppose the Russians in the plains of North Germany, a career was a massive culture change. After the mobile campaigns of 1950 in Korea, the armies now faced each other along the 38th parallel astride the Imjin River. Our centurion tanks, with their 20-pounder guns, were sighted in the infantry company positions on the hilltops facing the North Korean and Chinese troops in order to give close fire support. The winter weather was so cold, not only did we have to start up the tank engines every two hours, but the tanks themselves had to be moved out of their positions every four hours to prevent their tracks from being frozen into the ground. With over 50 degrees of frost, even whisky crystallised in the bottle. In these temperatures, and in mobile warfare, the 8th Hussars had been wearing battle dress. We were lucky enough to be issued with Canadian winter warfare kit that was extremely good and even better than the Americans. The main activities during this period were heavy shelling, mortaring and intensive night patrolling by the infantry of both sides. The difference was between the two sides that we had um, support of uh, the armoured regiment and uh, our artillery Whereas when the Chinese attacked, they had um, a lot of artillery support, but their main, um, the main factor was that they had unlimited supplies of infantry soldiers and they were not afraid to lose them in battle. In February 1951, Sea Squadron, commanded by Harry Walker, carried out an armoured raid into enemy territory with the aim of destroying bunkers from which fire was directed onto our positions. Third Troop Leader Alan Finlay was wounded and I was sent from squadron headquarters to take over. We reached our objective and were able to shell the Chinese positions, but without infantry support we were un unable to advance further and were eventually withdrawn. Later in June, Sea Squadron carried out another more successful raid in which several bunkers from which heavy fire had been directed onto our inf infantry positions were destroyed and First Troop Leader Charles Taylor was awarded an immediate military cross. But in crossing the paddy fields down into the valley between the two sides, the tanks had broken the bunts, with the result the area became flooded and five tanks were bogged and had to be abandoned. Their recovery was eventually achieved, but under intense shelling, which resulted in the death of an A Squadron Troop Leader, Andrew Albrecht, and the loss of a foot by Lieutenant Fergie Sutherland, who was later, after retiring to Ireland, to train the winner of the Cheltenham Gold Cup steeplechase. The summer brought intense heat and high humidity, and with the arrival of the monsoon season towards the end of June, the Injim River rose 30 feet, the bridges are swept away, and the forward troops are cut off and unable to be resupplied until the water receded. In November, B Squadron were heavily involved in the support of the Black Watch in a battle on the Hook feature, as a result of which 4th Troop Leader Michael Anstis was awarded an MC. After a year in Korea, the regiment was moved to the Egypt's Canal Zone, and I was posted to the Cheshire Yeomanry as adjutant. In 1955, I rejoined the regiment, who by then were in Cashrick as a training regiment, before we moved back to BOR at Sendelaga in 1957. In 1960... Um, at Sendelaga, uh, we formed part of the Armoured Brigade and I was uh, a squadron leader. The regiment has three squadrons of tanks and each is commanded by a major. 
1961, I went to the North Irish Horse in Ulster as second in command, and then returned to the regiment at Tidworth. Here, there were several major sporting achievements recorded. The regimental football team won the Cavalry Cup, and in 1964, regimental riders stamped their authority on the Grand Military Race Meeting at Sandown. Captain Nigel Ansell won the Gold Cup steeplechase with Threepwood, and we provided five runners in the Grand Military Hunter Chase, taking first, second and third places. Only twice before in the long history of these events had a regiment won both the Cavalry Cup and the Grand Military Gold Cup, and 25 years had elapsed since the Gold Cup winner was trained and ridden by his owner. From Tidworth, I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky, as the British Liaison Officer in 1964. The British Army had Liaison Officers at all the major posts of the uh, American arms, the infantry, armour, engineers, etc., artillery. And uh, in that position, one uh, acted really keeping the Ministry of Defence in touch with the latest developments in uh, American armoured equipment, especially tanks, and also assisted in instructing uh, American officers on the courses. Meanwhile, the regiment was sent to Aden, the worst trouble spot in the Middle East at that time, with squadrons in Bahrain and Hong Kong. And from there, they went to Libya and Cyprus in January 1936, and I rejoined them there in 1967. Regimental headquarters and B and C squadrons were located in a hutted camp just outside Benghazi, while A squadron went to Cyprus as part of the United Nations force. In June 1967, the Six-Day War broke out between Israel and the Arab states, and the Israelis started it at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Monday, knowing that the uh, Egyptian airfield commanders would be in their cars driving to their offices and with their out contact with their troops. And the Israeli Air Force very quickly uh, overcame any resistance by the Egyptian Air Force. Rioting immediately broke out in Benghazi, where the regiment's families occupied civilian accommodation. Our first task, therefore, was to collect them and put them into huts in our camp. Then C Squadron was ordered into the town to rescue the staff of the American consulate, who had locked themselves into their vault. But because Libya was a friendly country, we were not allowed to carry arms in the town, and on the way, C Squadron headquarters were surrounded by a mob who threw a petrol bomb into the command vehicle, setting it on fire and severely burning the crew, including the squadron leader Charles Taylor. They were only saved by the arrival of some sympathetic Arabs who got them into the nearby municipal hospital. Another crew member ran into a nearby building and up onto the roof where he was picked up by a helicopter of our air squadron, which had been trying to guide our vehicles away from streets controlled by mobs. Mention of the Air Squadron reminds me that another significant first for the regiment concerned our Air Squadron, now commanded by Walter Courage. It consisted of six Sioux American helicopters which had replaced the aging Auster light aircraft, and we were the first and for a long time the only regiment of the Army to provide all six pilots from within the regiment. Apart from their life-saving flights over the city during the riots of the Six-Day War, they provided the only means of getting quickly to and from Benina Airport, which was 14 miles by road from the city. Meanwhile, our commanding officer, Henry Woods, was summoned to garrison headquarters, and so I organised the defence of the camp. By this time, the perimeter was surrounded by the Libyan army with their guns facing inwards, so we placed our armoured cars on the inside with our guns facing outwards this time fully armed with ammunition permitted for use in training on the desert ranges. Eventually order was restored in the town and a delegation of senior Lib Libyan officer officers arrived at our gate. 
One of them was understood to be a certain Colonel Gaddafi. It was now time for me to take over command of the regiment from Henry Woods, who was uh, promoted and posted home to the Ministry of Defence. And one of my first problems concerned a squadron in Cyprus, where the Greeks and Turks were at each other's throats. It was the squadron's task to try and keep these forces apart, but when engaged in doing this, their families were left unprotected in the village of Ziggy. As they were the only British troops in Cyprus to have their families with them, I decided that we must get them flown out. On my way from Fort Knox to Libya, I had visited what was to be our next station in the UK, Wheaton Camp near Blackpool, and I reckoned that with the end of the summer season, the Blackpool landladies would welcome the arrival of our families. I therefore put the Chief of Staff... Right. Where have I finished? You, were, you just moved on to... <coughs> you were going into eight, uh, the RAF camp, but I've just put you back a bit. Because you mentioned the families with the... You mentioned the families, and I'm up here in the, se in the second paragraph. Yeah. You mentioned the family, but then you left it. You didn't actually say that's what happened. Oh, as it... You're here. Oh, uh, yeah. where you are. Yeah. We'll go right. back to that. Right, OK. All right? So what was my last... Can well, you're back, you, you, back, you, you, you then said you flew on to Cyprus and contacted Chief of Star. Oh, I see. Well, I... So you, we, we'll, do, we'll, do that, we'll do that bit again. Right, OK. All right? Where you go? I therefore flew to Cyprus and contacted the Chief of Staff of the United Nations Force, but he was either unable or unwilling to help, so I called on the GOC Cyprus, Major General Lloyd Dain, whom I had supported with my squadron on training in Germany when he commanded the Queen's Infantry Battalion. The families were flown home within a week, and they went moved into um, the Blackpool hotels and B&Bs until uh, accommodation could be found for them close to Wheaton Camp and they rejoined the regiment there later. The regiment was due back at UK at the end of the year, leaving B Squadron for a further three months to protect the RAF camp at El Adam, close to the Egyptian border. Eventually we were all reunited at Wheaton and this was the first time that the whole regiment had been together for five years. It was also significant that there was no headquarters between us and Western Command, and that we had no official role. This provided us with several opportunities to reunite and to train as a regiment, to use the proximity to Northern Ireland to increase our recruiting, and to enable our Irishmen to visit their homes in Ulster and Dublin at weekends and to make our mark in the sporting field, notably in cricket, football and squash. It also enabled us to revitalise the officers and the warrant officers and sergeants' messes. While most of our soldiers were Irish from north and south, many of our officers hailed from the southwest of England, where they had been recruited by our Colonel, Colonel Mike Ansell, and they made the very long return journey at weekends. One enterprising squadron leader, Bobby Faulkner, parked his horse box in a lay-by at the halfway point on the motorway so that he could get a few hours sleep there before completing the journey to Wheaton early on Monday morning in time to parade with his squadron at 8.30. Several of us who rode enjoyed hunting with the local packs, especially the Pendle Forest and Craven Harriers, who, in spite of their name, hunted foxes and hares over grass and stonewall country of the Ribblesdale Valley on the borders of Lancashire and Yorkshire. Probably our most significant action during the year was in fact to close, clear snow from the motorways and railways during the extremely hard winter of 1968-69. But more importantly, it enabled us to train together as an armoured car regiment in preparation for our return to BOR. This we did in March 1969, this time to Hereford, Two factors made this very different from our previous tours as an armoured regiment. First, as one of the three armoured car regiments in BOR, we were the only one under direct command of 1st British Corps, which again enabled us to organise our own training. And secondly, our training was no longer confined 
to the Rhine Army's tank training areas. I also discovered that one of my friends from Fort Knox was now commanding an armoured cavalry regiment not far, far from Bayreuth, and he agreed to provide us with fuel and rations if I brought the regiment into the US zone. Having flown down to Bavaria to plan our training, I arranged for the regiment to be put on a train to Bayreuth, where opera goers emerging in the evening dress from the performance of Wagner were somewhat surprised to be passed by a column of armoured cars. Our exercise took us south via Nuremberg and Munich to Rosenheim, close to the Austrian border, where I had previously arranged for the three squadrons and regimental headquarters to occupy fields close to villages. Never before had the British Army been seen in the area, and the hospitality of the villagers was such that it was touch and go as to whether the exercise that was to take us back to Bayreuth could start on time on the Monday morning. In March 1970, I handed over command of the regiment to Charles Taylor, who had made a miraculous recovery from the severe burns that he'd received in Benghazi. He would later move the regiment to Munster to revert to the role of an armoured regiment with the new chieftain tanks, while I moved to command of the RAC Tactical School at Lulworth. The Royal Army Corps Tactical School at Lulworth was a small unit which um, had two main jobs. The first was to uh, keep uh, armoured tactics abreast of the introduction of any new equipment. And the second was to run courses uh, both for newly commissioned officers who would come there before joining their regiments and later also for uh, tank commanders uh, in order to assist them in their job in the regiment. It uh, consisted of uh, a lieutenant colonel and four or five major instructors. After a year there, um, After a year at the tactical school, I was selected as, uh, to go as defence attaché in Rome. Uh, normally, uh, if one's selected to do a job like that, you have a year's training, which includes language training, plus um, training for the job itself. In my case, my uh, training was cut short because um, my predecessor was promoted and moved off to the United Nations headquarters in Geneva, and so I had to go uh, with only about three months' training. It was an extremely interesting appointment, based in Rome, and the job one did went sometimes from the sublime to the ridiculous. For example, uh, one day I had to take the British defence, uh, British Secretary of State for Defence. Lord Carrington, to call on the Italian president at his palace in Rome because of problems that we were having with uh, Don Mintoff in Malta. On the following day, I was instructed to fly up quickly to the Aosta Valley in, in the north where a detachment of Royal Marines who were training in the mountains had a bust up with the Alpini in one of the local pubs, and I had to go up there and, and sort this out. But it was a fascinating job, lovely place to live, and at the end of it, after two and a half years in Rome, I retired from the army. Mr. Wahoo, may I just ask you, uh, you, you were married while you were in the army, can I just ask you about your recollections of married life in the army, married quarters, education of children, etc. Yes, certainly. Um, I suppose really the army looked after us pretty well. Um, every major station had its married quarters, and uh, the um, wives of, of the um, married officers and soldiers came out in, into my course in the station. 
of course, a problem was posed by the education of children, because with the regiment move, moving, tending to move at least every two years, if not more frequently, um, this resulted in a complete lack of continuity in, in children's education. And the army understood this, and therefore they arranged a scheme whereby one could send one's children into a boarding school uh, with much of the expense paid by the army and also the children would be flown out to join their parents during the school holidays. This meant that they, they had continuity of education and the parents were able to see them during, during the holidays. Um, we actually took this a step further at Senlager because um, the wife of our commanding officer, Michael Tonkin, um, realised that there were a large number of children under school age and there was no provision for them. And so she organised in Senlager a kindergarten, uh, hired staff to run it, and probably the staff largely came from the wives of, of uh, officers and soldiers anyway, and provided a basic education for children until they were old enough to go to boarding school. And a lot of the other regiments in Senelaga joined in and helped, and eventually the army took on this idea, and this happened in all the major stations. So I think we can say that, by and large, the army looked after its married families in those days pretty well. Mr. Weber, you have mentioned back in 1964, when you were Lieutenant Colonel, you were posted to Fort Knox in the United States as the British Liaison Officer. Can I just ask you to reflect on the time that you spent at Fort Knox? Yes, certainly it was interesting and enjoyable. Uh, I had two jobs, really. The first was um, to keep in touch with American developments in arms and equipment, and especially tanks, and to keep the British Ministry of Defence informed as to what was going on. And my secondary job was also uh, instruct the American officers' courses, mostly year-long courses. Um, but the interesting part was that um, this was the height of the Vietnam War, and the average length of stay of an American lieutenant colonel at Fort Knox was about nine months. So after I'd been there for a year, and I spent two and a half years there. I was the longest serving officer in the whole post. And as a result, I, was, uh, I found myself briefing visitors to the Armoured Centre on what went on at the centre itself. And visiting American generals from other arms found this rather surprising. <laughs> but um, it was extremely interesting. And the other thing I must mention was that the Americans were, in one word, Anglophiles. They loved England. The whole time that I was in America, two and a half years, I only went, met one American who was not pro-English. And, uh, for example, in Fort Knox, while I was there, there occurred the death of Sir Winston Churchill. And uh, he was a famous figure in America as well as in England. And I remember I received, I think it was Illustrated London News edition, which had his portrait on the, on the front cover. And I was seen with this one day by an American who said, Hey, can you present this to our museum? So I said, yes, if you'd like it, and, and I ended up by having a full-scale sort of military presentation <laughs> in uniform 
to the curator of the museum and this was sort of recorded and, and uh, they absolutely loved it. And it's the same today. I mean, they're almost as interested in the birth of the royal boy th than we are. Mr. Wolfram, you clearly had lots of experience as an army officer at various ranks and in various postings. Can I just ask you, please, what you consider is necessary to make a good relationship between an officer and a member of the lower ranks? Yes, and in one word, I would say trust. Um, as an officer, you're going to, sometimes in very difficult situations, order a soldier to do something he might not want to do. Uh, it is essential to build up trust so that he respects you and, and understands that, that um, difficult things that you're ordering to him to do have to be done, but that you've also done everything possible to make what has to be done as uh, safe and secure as possible. And if there is no trust, then I don't believe the task will be carried out as it should be. And that, I think, must be the basis of the relationship between the commander and the junior ranks. I might say, Mr. Wolfram, that is discipline. Yes, discipline in, implies that it's a strict, um, which it is, after all, yes, yes, it is discipline. But discipline without trust is not going to be the, the whole story. You can order a soldier to do something extremely unpleasant and very dangerous, but if, if, if you don't have his trust, it's unlikely that he will do it as well as he could. As a finale, would you like to just generally discuss the differences as you see them between the army that you left and the army that you joined, including the ability of the soldier? Well, it's a difficult question. When I joined the army, it was during the war, so um, it was not a voluntary occupation. Everybody got called up to do something, even if it was going down the mines. Um, later on, when national service continued after the war, the military intake included a lot of people who would not have joined the army. Um, they were more intelligent, uh, with brighter prospects than many of those who would have joined the army, but they were caught up in the national service trap. And the result was that in the regiment we had a lot of high-class soldiers, very intelligent, keen and efficient. But of course we lost them after two years. And I believe one of the successes of the regiment is due to the fact we managed to persuade a number of those to stay on in the army. And many of them got promoted um, into the warrant office and sergeant's mess. Some became regimental sergeant majors and some became commissioned. And so from that national service in, intake, uh, the army did get a significant um, Im improvement in its, the pe people it, it recruited. Um, today, the problem is, is rather different. The problem today in British society is the number of people who are, for one reason or another, out of work, un unemployed, 
and they drift into committing, to start with, very minor crimes, then perhaps slightly more serious ones. They go in and out of prison. They come from families who can't give them proper support. And there's no deterrent to stop them committing crimes because uh, when they go into prison, they're better off, many of them, they are outside. They have, um, they're looked after, they have a, a room, they have television, they're fed properly, and um, you know, they probably would be better off in the army. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think it does. So would you say that to join the army, or whatever rank, would be a good career to take up today? I think it's an excellent career. It's a, it's a structured career. It is uh, wildly diversified. There are endless things that you can do. Um, and yes, I, I think it is, it is today, the armed services provide a, a, a career that is well worth undertaking. Well, Mr. Waltham, thank you very much for spending this time with me this morning. I am now ending this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you.